Hello and welcome. I'm Christian Salinas, the Artistic and Executive Director of QFest 2021, the Houston 25th Annual LGBTQ International Film Festival. Uh, today, we are hosting a panel in honor of our 20th anniversary screening of the wedding video, which premiered here in Houston back in 2001 when QFest was known as the Houston Gay and Lesbian Film Festival. And it showcased at the Rice Media Center, which also is no more. It was just demolished this year. So this is quite a special reunion. We've got a remarkable assortment of uh, cast members from the real world. And first, before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Our first sponsor, of course, is our presenting sponsor, Homelight. Our major funder, the John Stephen Kellett Foundation. Our program sponsors, the Hollyfield Foundation and the, and the Houston Arts Alliance. I'd also like to thank our media sponsor, Spectrum South and Houston Media Source, who is helping us put on this panel today. Um, so it is my honor and pleasure to welcome Dan Renzi, who will be moderating this panel. Dan is, uh, is someone that I haven't seen in quite some time, so I'm glad to see your beautiful smiling face. And uh, certainly everybody else who was uh, present at that screening and everyone who was here to uh, recognize the 20th anniversary. So Dan, I hand it off to you. Well, hello, everybody. Again. How are we doing today? Good. We're going to go Dan. around. I know most of you. There's a few of you. Julie, that I've wanted to meet ever since I was in high school, so I'm holding it together, but we're going to get to that in a little bit. If we could just go around um, uh, and everyone introduce themselves and uh, say where you are right now. And I'm on my screen. We have Lars in the upper left. All right, I'll start. Uh, Lars from Real World London, and I currently live in Los Angeles. You do? Where in I Los do. Angeles do you live? Uh, downtown in the Arts District. Fantastic. Very cool. Very cool. Who's next? How about Mike? Oh, uh, hi, I'm Mike. Um, I happen to be Dan's old roommate from <laughs> the fifth season in Miami, and I am currently in Atlantic Beach, Florida. Fantastic. And then how about we go over to, um, I see Corey looking gorgeous. Hey, Dan. Oh, hi. I'm Corey, I was on Real World San Francisco, and I'm living in Long Beach. Living in yeah. Long Beach. Yeah, and um, how about we go um, down, or we go up to, on my screen, we have Norm. Norm, how are you? I'm doing great, Dan. Thanks for doing this. And I want to thank the uh, QFest for bringing us back. It's just such a pleasure. And it's so great to see all your faces. I'm just, I wish we were all in the same room. Um, I'm living in Michigan now. I've moved back to my hometown in Ironwood, Michigan. And uh, I'm just excited to be here. I have a thunderstorm coming in, so hopefully I won't lose power. All right. So, um, Clint, could you introduce yourself, please? Because were you all real, real Clint? No. Hi, Dan. Thanks again for uh, for moderating this, um, and thank you, Christian, for having us back. Um, I'm splitting my time. I was not in the real world, but I co-directed with uh, the lovely Norman Corby back in the day and attended the festival. Uh, I'm splitting my time here between West Hollywood and uh, Joshua Tree. We've had such a buildup. <laughs> We've had such a buildup to the final guest in the panel. So exciting. Cyrus. So exciting to meet the one and only Julie. Yay! This Did is a big know? deal. I hope I don't disappoint you. Oh, never. No, Mike's here, so he's got that covered. So, um, <laughs> no, but Julie, I've wanted to meet you since I was in high school, and I watched, I mean, you and Norm were like my best friends when I was, a, a scrawny gayling in, in Overland Park, Kansas by myself, dreaming of being in the loft with you guys. All right, so, so let's get down to brass tacks. It has been 20 years since this, uh, since this movie has been made. And, you know, everyone at this point has a camera on their phones and anyone can make a YouTube video. But back in the day, making a movie was a pretty big deal, even if it was just an independent film that you're making with your friends. So how exciting is it to look back 20 years and remember this project that you guys did, that it still has a, it's coming back to life along with all the reunions of the real world cast that are being brought back as well. 
Um, it's, it's, it's amazing. And it really was a difficult feat for us, um, building up to the, the wedding video, you know, we wanted to shoot on film and it just, it was so cost prohibitive. You know, we had so many different iterations of what we we're going to do. We were going to do like a snuff film, we had all these different casts. Um, we want to thank you, Dan, because we actually moved into the castle because you were going to move in that castle and then you yeah. moved away. And so you, yes. you shared it to us and they were like, so, you brought it to me and Rachel. Explain, explain what happened here. So, uh, yeah. and if I can, a friend of mine had worked for an architect and she was helping him rent out what was honestly in, it's in Beverly Hills, isn't it? Yeah. Is it? yeah. Beverly Hills. It's a house that's, it was built like a castle. It's a really bizarre, beautiful house. And we were all thinking of moving in there and it ended up being a bunch of because those are the people that I knew at the time. I knew Norm from the Beth. real world of New York and I knew Rachel from the real world San Francisco. Yeah. And one by one, Mike ended up moving in there and all these people ended up moving in the house and there ended up being no room for me. So I didn't get to move in, which I appreciated. And then everyone was in your movie, except for me. And I'm the only person that was not in the movie. So I appreciate that too. I'm glad you had so much fun. That's great. But um, all so you ended up making this movie. Where did you get the idea to make? Where did you get the idea to make a movie? Okay, so um, well, the idea kind of came from you know um, actually we went to Rachel and Sean's wedding, which kind of was a little bit of a shotgun wedding, and I think Mike came with me to that, and Jacinda and a few people, and it was right. pretty much a slap together. Rachel was about to be on the View. And she's like, Norm, can you just film this whole thing? And it wound up being like a disaster. And I needed to edit the tape before Barbara Walters saw it because there was like Rachel's face in the cake and families were fighting. And it just wasn't really anything good to put on ABC on Monday. And, you know, so we shot this whole thing on Sunday. And she was, you know, it was just like the wedding was all jumped together. You know, they were having their baby a little early. And so there was a lot of stress there. And so, you know, I, the takeaway from that was like, there could actually be something here as far as a movie is like this whole chaos going on and then everything being edited away into something perfect. So, so um, you know, and back then, like I, I said earlier, making a movie back then was a much bigger deal. Like you did not just pull your phone out and make a YouTube video. So like what was involved in back in what was 2001, uh, back at the turn of the century of making a movie. I mean, it, you know, there's cameras and lighting and all sorts of stuff. You don't, it's not something you can just do on a whim. Right. Clint, why don't you jump in? Well, actually, Dan, you can. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, um, we, uh, Norman and I went and we bought a couple video cameras and uh, figured it out. It was, it was really awkward because it was, it was the, you know, the last year uh, when they were still using actual um, tape in the cameras. So we shot everything on mini DV. Um, uh, and then uh, the following year after we shot, everything went to actual, you know, uh, memory sticks that you would put on the cameras. So um, we had to manage all the tapes and we just bought the cameras and read the instruction manuals as we were flying to wherever we were to start filming people and figured it out as we went along. Um, they would show up at your house and pull the manual out. <laughs> all the time we had no idea what we were doing like okay well how do you change the batteries i mean they literally <laughs> had to figure all of this out but they did that was kind of the amazing part was that they really did like get the equipment and figure this out and put the whole puzzle together yeah, yeah. in terms in terms of your participation like you know i I'll, People at the time didn't really know, like the Hollywood industry didn't really know what to do with reality TV people because we're not actors, we're not people who necessarily, I mean, people had talents besides being in a reality show, but we were sort of shopped around Hollywood, not with, people didn't really know what to do with us. Like, are we actors? Are we not? Did any of you have any actual like improv? Like I can tell you, I mean, my roommate Mike is very, very funny. And, you know, like, there's a certain comic timing that Mike has that is fantastic. But in terms of acting, you know, like, do any of you um, have, like, actual acting experience? Because this is all improv. I mean, it's a, a big project to improv your way through. Duly. I'm going to guess no, that none of you... 
<laughs> no, we don't. I mean, <laughs> that was a long silence. <laughs> for, for me, I think for me, uh, Norm tried to make it real easy for me because he said, Lars, could you please play a conceited, arrogant German DJ? Really snobby at that, you know, and it was like, it's going to be really hard to pull off. <laughs> so, yeah, the because in, the, thing in was this movie, you, you play people you wanna... with your own names, but you are, you are different characters than who you are in real life. You know what I compare it to, honestly, if you look at, um, you know, after we shot this, obviously, like Curb Your Enthusiasm, Larry mm -hmm. David would have on people and it wasn't scripted. What they did was like, here, this is the scene. This is what you need to do. Right. Play your part. It's basically what Norm and Clint did is they came to all of us and said, hey, you know, here's your part. This is what we're looking for in this scene. Do your thing. If we like it, we'll use it. If not, you know, we'll cut it. Wonderful. Well, and when you're in a pro back in 2001, people, I think if they're especially of a, gen a younger generation, they don't understand that a same gender wedding back then was a much bigger deal than it is now. And so do you, I mean, did you, did you have any nerves about at the time about being in a movie about what was kind of a taboo subject or, I mean, do you sort of look back now and sort of, you know, think it was all overblown or, I mean, do you understand at the time it was actually a pretty touchy subject to talk about on film? I mean, you know, it's so interesting that I, I guess I don't, um, no, I didn't have any hesitation. You know, anything that Clint and Norman were doing, I would want to be a part of and um, excited to be a part of. But it has been funny explaining to my kids, my son is 20 years old. And so, and my daughter is 17. And explaining to them, like, they don't really get why this movie would be anything because, you know, of course today, you know, they're like, why would this have been such a big deal? You know, and so it's really difficult to put into words just um, how taboo it was and um, and how cutting edge it really was and how forward thinking it was and how much it did really push the conversation forward. Because there was a scene in the movie when the wedding coordinators were taking it back that it was a wedding with two men. Now wedding coordinators would love to have weddings between two men because they know the budgets are going to be lavish. It's going to be fabulous and all the stereotypes that go along with it, right. some of which are true. But I think also, I mean, Julie, I'm wondering if some of that was also came from your growth of being on the real world itself that I don't, you know, like having seen some of the conversations because I've watched the real world original New York season like 20 times and know probably more lines that you said than you remember. But uh, there's a lot of just growth about learning about just basic diversity and learning about these political issues that do you think that even being on the real world sort of opened your eyes to some of these topics? Oh, yeah, I do think that it... Um opened my eyes to the importance of the topics, but also, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, I'm just really close with Norman and really always, I'm saying, even if it's not something political, I'm going to support him. Any of his art artistic endeavors, I want to be supportive of. And so, I mean, I love that this is what the topic was, but, you know, I've got his back no matter what he's doing. Oh. Do you do you remember filming any of, um, back to everybody else, do you remember any of the moments that you thought were particularly fun or your favorite moments? The hayride. The, the dildo scene with Heather. <laughs> and you. Where is Heather? That <laughs> I mean, that was, that was fun. Is I feel that... like we kept wanting to redo that one too. We go, oh, no, 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 let's do it one more time. No. Yeah, like. <laughs> yeah, too bad for everyone who wasn't in that scene because everyone's like, and Lars is like, oh, darn it, I missed the dildo scene. Too bad. Um, what about, I mean, other, I mean, any other, besides the dildo scene, any other favorites? I remember the hayride. Um, I think Kirby was in that and, and Pam, if I'm not mistaken, but we did a hayride. Yeah. And I think we all got pretty liquored up before that. Yeah. And I forget, I know, I know it was up in the canyon somewhere, but I do remember that being pretty fun. And obviously a lot of the stuff we shot at the house because that's where we lived. Yeah. So a lot of that stuff blends in because, you know, like Corey, a lot of the people that were in the film were also our friends besides that. So that we would have a lot of stuff going on at the house. So some, some of it kind of bled into the others 
where I don't remember if it was filming or just partying. But I do remember oh. hanging out with Corey in the pool, but I think that was for the film. So. Oh. <laughs> well, I think it was in it as well. I don't have to go back and watch it, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Nothing naughty. Nothing naughty. Well, so what are you, uh, what is everybody up to now? Corey, what are you doing these days? Well, first of all, I just want to say um, back to like being a part of it and kind of back, piggybacking on what Julie said, it's, and what you said, it, it is so interesting that then it was so cutting edge, not just the concept of this idea of how we edit ourselves on social media, which Norman and Clint were so, I don't know, visionary in seeing that. And I feel like now everybody just does it every day on social media. We all just sort of edit ourselves. And I, I recently just kind of stopped because I just get tired of wondering, you know, what else is going on in people's lives besides just the cute picture that they posted or whatever. And I think that just that concept itself was so cutting edge. And then the whole idea of like Julie said, um, you know, this marriage between two men, which now would be, just be, like you said, Dan, so much fun for somebody to get to coordinate and so much fun to get to air on television. But at the time it was a really big deal. And um, I think seeing Sean and Pedro have their little ceremony um, in San Francisco. Oh, it's Cyrus. So <laughs> like for me, that was also just eye-opening um, to see that and to really know I, I, it was eye-opening. And then to be a part of this, just making it more mainstream and making it more talked about and making people more aware. And now we say that we see that, you know, it's not a shock, but back then it really was. And I think what Clint and Norm were doing, and I think just what I was able to experience um, in San Francisco with Sean and Pedro was, uh, it was a big part of my life and really impacted me and changed me in a lot of ways. Now I'm a middle school teacher. And I remember when I met you, Corey, the first time, and I was taken aback by how confident and how just big your personality was. Because when you were on the real world in San Francisco, a lot of your story was that you were one of the shire, you know, house members and you made comments that you wish you had culture and that whatever you you wish you had a culture like the other housemates. And when I met you, I was like, this is not the Corey that was on the show. This Corey, you had this big smile and you were full of energy and you were so much fun. And I thought it was the same thing that I was saying with Julie, like what a growth process that this show has must have been for, for you because you just seemed like you had just come leaps and bounds. And I've, people, when they watch reality shows now, I think sometimes they miss the point of what these shows were once upon a time. It was much more educational and exploratory. And, you know, and I think of the Miami season, we were sort of a turning point where we sort of delved into some, <laughs> some terrible behavior. And I was responsible for a lot of that. But so I apologize. But, um, you know, back then, topics like, you know, a same same gender wedding. I'm not even going to say same sex anymore. We got to use the right terminology. I mean, these were things that were done very much on purpose to not only educate ourselves as a cast member, but educate the people who were watching the show. And is that Cyrus that I see on my it's screen? Cyrus. Hello. Is that a doo-doo from? So fashionably late as always. How are you, Cyrus? Uh, plane was delayed as usual. Yeah, but I'm here. My Wi-Fi wasn't working at all. Uh, well, we're glad that you're here. We're talking about the wedding video and, and what uh, the experience of filming it back then, uh, the experience of, in 20 years ago, the perspective of how it felt different to be a part of a project back then versus, you know, now it probably wouldn't be as big of a deal. How did you feel, like, were you ever have any doubts about being in a, in a, a movie about this topic? Or what did you think? at the time. I thought my boy Norm contacted me and wanted me to be a part of something. And I thought I could not miss out on that, whatever it was. I trusted him. Um, I... Oh. It's life, let's do it. Good. But nowadays, it's going in and out, Cyrus. Different. I think it's a little different nowadays, but I think at the same time, I think um, when you're 
when you're seeing something that the rest of the world may not be seeing, it doesn't always feel normal. But when you're in the moment, you know when it's right. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So, okay. So I, I got a lot of flack for the movie from my end a little bit. Heather B acting a fool, messing with me, smacking <laughs> me in the head with that. I don't know if you guys remember that on the highway in my truck. On the highway. I got a lot of flack for that. Really? But at the same time, it was all in good fun and I had a blast. Wow. Well, that's unfortunate that that happened. <laughs> Lars, I, Lars, you don't seem that it, I mean, if it doesn't seem like you come from a background where being in a movie about a gay wedding would have ever been a problem. <laughs> no. The, the, I mean, the international DJ said they, they're generally somewhat understanding about LGBTQ culture. I mean, I lived in Milan and then in Berlin in the early 90s. And um, this is sort of before I actually became a DJ. I was more of a club promoter back then. Um, but I was still like figuring this whole music thing out. And the music I was listening to, which was like New York, Deep House, um, was really only played in gay clubs. Mm -hmm. You know, so back in 91, 92, 93, you know, before I became a touring DJ myself, probably half the clubs, if not more, I went to were, were gay clubs, you know? And it was like, you know, like Sunday afternoons, I'd go to the tea dance. That was just the thing, you know? And so- Me too. Um, and, um, <laughs> you know, and so when I then lived in London, um, what, what happened there, um, the, the biggest club in London was the Ministry of Sound. And uh, the people who would headline Ministry of Sound on a Saturday, people like, I don't know, masses at work or, you know, DJs like that, on a Sunday, they would play um, a, like a, a gay after hours party. And uh, so it was a great uh, way of seeing like a really big name DJ in a really intimate um, club, like in a club that only held like three, 400 people or whatever. And um, the first night I went, um, I remember speaking to Matt Kunitz, our, our production coordinator, like right before I left the house and I said, are the cameras coming? He goes, no, no, they told us we're not allowed because it's a gay club because apparently there's, you know, a lot of celebrities who go who are still in the closet, blah, blah, blah. They weren't letting any cameras in. Well, guess what? I ended up going to the club every Sunday because it was like my way to escape the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had, we had a place like that in Miami too. So, um, I have a, so Mike, have you been to uh, any, do you know anyone else who's been married? Any gentlemen who've married each other <laughs> <laughs> off the top of my head no what do you have to tell us mike <laughs> well no i'm just trying to think i mean honestly dan i dan's the one i mean when we started our miami season dan's the one who kind of introduced me to the whole gay culture because yeah, i didn't know what south beach was yeah i mean remember the rainbow flag i had no, no that's what i was just gonna say i was just gonna uh, say we went no fucking <laughs> idea what the rainbow flag was I, Wait, Mike, I went on a job interview. I went on a job interview to be a waiter at a restaurant that had drag performances and they had a rainbow flag on the door. And we were trying to explain what the rainbow flag on the door meant to Mike. And he was just like, what is that? That oh means that. And he's you know standing there. And again, you know, it's you know, I I I I gripe about political correctness because if on paper you had that conversation someone would end up getting canceled by <laughs> society. But when you have someone like Mike, who's just asking questions and learning about everything and then just taking it in stride, like, I mean, that, that to me, it was just such a more honest reaction that meant something rather than being politically correct. That was someone who was actually trying to be friendly and get along with people and learn something. And he was like, oh, oh, okay. You know, and just not really sure what to say, but it's like, if you're not sure what to say, I mean, that's, that's part of the process. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and I, if I ever got married, Mike, I promise you would have an invitation, but that hasn't Thanks, happened. Dan. Oh my God. So dark, it's but Mike, again, growth, we're all here to grow as humans. Well, you know, you were like the first gay person I ever hung out with. Probably the last. I'm from in Florida as the Bible Belt. So they're yeah. hanging I, mean, I follow you on Facebook. I see your friends, Mike. I think I'm the only other gay person other than Norm that you've ever met. So no, I got I got some gay friends. But then, you know, living with Norm, moving out to L.A. and living with Norm, I mean, I got immersed in this whole thing. And then there's the gay wedding video that I'm in. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. Tell them about yeah. The, yeah, the, the rainbow flag. 
leg. I used to put it like a magnetic one on Mike's car. Oh, oh yeah, that's and right. You'd go driving around, and you'd come back to the house so mad because everyone would be like, checking Mike out. I mean, he couldn't figure out what was going on. Actually, Norm, the one where you got me the worst, was we were living in the castle, and you came down to my room, and you said, hey, Mike, we're going, I think it was Rage, was the bar in West Hollywood. You're like, come with me to Rage. I need a wingman. Come with me. I'm like, Norm, it's gay bar, but you know what? I'll go. So I put on all my Jacksonville Jaguar shirts and hat, like, you know, trying to look as great as possible. And we walk yeah. in, and the first thing Norm says to me is, he's, hey, man, look, if anybody get, get you a drink, you know, don't drink it. Make sure it's a beer. It's, you know, it's got the lid on everything. And I walk in, and every guy is trying to hit on me. And I'm like, Norm. He's like, yeah, the straighter you look, the more they want you. I was like, yeah, learn that. It's a curse, way. Mike. I mean, it's just that yeah. that raw sexuality that you've got, Mike. It's just Hot like, Mike. You know, I mean, just seeping your pores. Like, I don't know. I mean, it's a curse. I mean, how how do we all restrain ourselves? Well, listen, I mean, we've been, I was put on a very tight time schedule um, for this interview. We don't want to take too much of your time. Um, but, you know, all we just, Norm, your, your movie lives on. Um, what do you have to say to people about uh, wanting, you know, why do you want people to watch this movie? Well, you know, um, in, in the movie, I mean, it is a little hidden gem, but um, it really served a purpose that I wanted to do was to bring, you know, new allies into the gay community and through comedy, showing the audience that through these funny moments, these sophomoric moments, you know, you learn something, you know, about somebody. And then at the end, you end up caring about them. You know, it turns like a mother who won't come to a gay wedding. And once the, uh, you know, the editor edits everything down to this little three minute piece, you know, there's her heart, you know? And it's so interesting that actually the character arc in the movie is invisible. It's Clint's voice. You know, it's so weird that you never see the character, you just hear the voice and it's his sophomoric decision of all of this stuff. And he, you know, he's trying to make this money, you know, $10,000 and all of a sudden he does the right thing. And he says, I, I need to make something really nice. And even if it's going to not be the truth here, you know, it's what this guy wants. And so that's kind of interesting. And, and, it, and, and it really touched upon issues. You know, I wanted to set Sky up with being from Canada to show people that we didn't have the same rights. You know, I couldn't just marry somebody from with the same rights that, you know, everyone else had, you know, and it gave people something to think about through comedy and, 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 and through the real world and all of you people, I just bless you all because, you know, you have been that classic word al allies right now. It seems to be the big buzz, but it's really true. I mean, people saw our lives and how we interact to help them move forward. And we have done such a huge service to, uh, you know, our, our country, you know, by, you know, including our voices. And I want to salute everybody and hug you. Nah, 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 nah. Nah. Well, it has been a pleasure. Um, if, and it's, the, the, real, the real world is being brought back. There's a whole, uh, what is it called? The, the OG movement. The OGs, you know, they're bringing they're bringing the old seasons back. Ooh. Everyone on this screen who's in the real, yeah. I mean, Norm and Julie have already done it. The rest of us will be getting phone calls one way or another. Corey, have you been asked to do any challenges? No? Nope. Why not? You should call them. You seem tough. You know, you can get out there and like pole wrestle or whatever, you know, and they <laughs> Norm had the pole best or like ever. each other up. You could do that. Oh man! Had the I, best was, I, I probably couldn't, but then yeah, I I uh, yeah no I I'm good. I think the you're one like no, nah, I'm good. Yeah. Yes, but okay. there's there is a I think you know with a lot of TV production being shut down, they started running reruns of shows, and it sort of invigorated reinvigorated interest in these old seasons, and so I mean a lot of the a lot of us are going to be started getting dragged back, whether, whether we like it or not. <laughs> and so we have to, I mean, do you, how do you feel about, I mean, you mean Norm and Julie already did their reunion, but like, you know, Lars and Corey and, and I know Cyrus would like to do it, but how do you feel about going back in the house and going for round two of being on the real world again? 
Well, I don't think it would take up five months the way it did back in no, 1995. It's so if it's, if it's only a week or two, I mean, um, Real World London actually did um, just a Zoom reunion uh, in June of this year. And yeah. uh, I think uh, in June of last year, um, Sharon was actually the one who organized it. And, um, and so this year we were, we were kind of talking about it and I'd love to see everybody again, you know? So if I have an opportunity to spend a week in London and, uh, you know, hang out with my old friends or whatever, um, I'd be down for that. Or even better if we could, uh, go back to Kenya yeah. for a week or two. But do you feel like you have anything to say? I mean, back then, you know, I mean, the conversations on camera were a lot different. Like what do you feel like? Do you feel like we belong in front of cameras anymore? Or <laughs> I mean, there's no other way to say it. I mean, let's face it. I mean, the vast majority of people on reality TV um, do not belong in front of a camera. I mean, I don't Ooh, watch any. That's deep. That's deep. Sorry, I don't. I don't watch any of that stuff. I've never watched a single episode of the Kardashians or, or any of that stuff, Housewives or any of these shows. It's I don't know. It just doesn't interest me. And I mean, I watched. With Real World, I mean, I guess I watched your season and then I think I watched Boston and that was it. And then I stopped watching it. I haven't seen anything since then. So it's, I don't know. So <laughs> <It's> it's, <laughs> it's, yeah. Well, I love the Boston. I love them all. And I will say, um, I think I was real kind of, um, I don't know if confused is the right word, but maybe concerned about why, why would we go back on television and what do we bring to the table? What's the, you know, what what are we bringing that's different and and i kind of struggled with that and then this interesting thing happened though with my daughter where she was kind of um her and a girlfriend have had a little bit of a miscommunication a little bit of a disagreement and they really could not work out how to get past it and she was like you know i mean i've texted her but then she didn't respond and then the, and i was like you will have to go and actually talk to her and work past this, even if you think you're right or she thinks she's right, there ha you have to learn how to get conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. And do you know, neither one of those girls had ever worked through a conflict with a friend. Mm. And so I think that is something that we bring to the table that we, you know, or my cast and the people you see on the screen, like we are interested in what the other person has to say. And we do want to like, how do you help these friendships grow and these real, you know, all of these things. And so that's what we bring to the table. Yeah, that's why I mean, we should be on camera. And your, and your season was a lot good. At, it was a lot better at that than ours. I mean, like I can tell you having lived like someone like Mike, Mike was a lot easier to live with than I was. <laughs> and I mean, he's such an infinitely more. nicer person camera than effect. me, you know, and I think that, you know, so, sometimes on reality shows, we just scream at each other and it is it is a learning process of I mean, we're doing it in front of the camera of learning how to work through conflicts yes. and some of the big you know the biggest fight one of the biggest fights in real world history was from from my mouth and it's something that will haunt me you know for, until it'll be on my gravestone and it you know you do have an opportunity going on these shows i would like to go back and talk to my roommates older and calmer and having less energy and more interest in what people have to say, you know, and just like talk to each other like human beings as opposed to just this energy, you know, this energy of being on camera. Because back then, I mean, there were so many more conversations to be having, like whether it be same gender marriage or, you know, the racial and ethnic conflicts that are that will always be part of our society, that will always be part of our lives. You know, the conversations that between you and Kevin on the street, when you're pushing each other and shouting at each other, that could have happened today and probably does happen today. And so these conversations, if they aired, <laughs> were perhaps more relevant. And I would hope that if we went back, you know, for the Miami season, that maybe we would just be a little nicer to each other. And yeah, I don't know. Corey, would you do it? I'd love, I'd love to do that and go back and just, um, I think with the perspective we have now, you can look at it differently than like a 19 year old girl making a decision. I mean, the thing with me is like, I, 
I look at Pedro, I look at some people in that house and they're like out there changing the world. And I'm a clueless 19 year old and didn't like completely understand. Um, and I mean, I did. And of course I did more as time went on and um, as relationships built and changed, but I think it would be nice to be able to look at it from the perspective of now yeah. and talk to people from the perspective of now. Um, and maybe, you know, just, I think with our group, um, it would still be tense. It would be tense and also wonder, I mean, with Pedro's no longer with us and I don't even know if they would ask Puck because he's had such a troubled time. And I, just, I really like Puck, but I know that he's had some problems. And so I don't know if they would even have him back, you know? Yeah, so I, I think it'd be hard to have a, a whole cast back. And then, you know, who knows? Yeah, so that's- well, I problem. do have to tell you, if they do call you, you've got to do a 700 page questionnaire and then you have to <laughs> analyze by a psychologist. So you're not going to shoot somebody on camera and it takes up two days. <laughs> and you have to go through that sex education course. And you got to go through the STDs in case you're going to screw somebody. Yeah, I, I know they have, they have if it's, there's an STD F55. awareness class that you have to go through. And for if the Boston cast was to ever do something, Cyrus's roommate, Camila, is now an oh. OBGYN. I mean, she literally is an obstetrician gynecologist, and they're still going to make her go through a sex education <laughs> class. You got to watch, well, watch the videos with them watching you watch the videos. Yeah. <laughs> Cyrus, I mean, I know that I, on a personal note, I happen to know Cyrus was very enthusiastic about uh, doing uh, a, a reunion. If they were to mix cast Cyrus and bring you back and throw you into another cast, which cast would you want to be in for a reunion? I mean, that's a no brainer. I would be in freaking Miami, bro. Woo, yes. I, I'm, I'm there right now, actually. <laughs> uh, I'm in Miami right now. So oh, you are? Like, me? Where are you? I just flew in. I told you my flight was late. And da -da -da -da. I know. Oh. But like where, I mean, where is, in what building, like where in Miami are you? I'm in South Beach at the Shelbourne. Oh. I literally just oh. got checked in. My bitch is still over there. We're doing a tasting for my wedding out here. Oh. Coming up. Yeah. Wedding? You getting oh. married? Yes. Congratulations, Cyrus. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Wait, I'm gonna Have cry. Birthday party, when you get married. married. You need a videographer? Clint, are you available? <laughs> Baby, Clint, Clint is Clint available. <laughs> yeah, my, my rate's gone up significantly since we did this movie, but... I but he knows how to work the equipment now. <laughs> After reading the instructions <laughs> in Julie's living room, he understands how to work the camera. It's great. <laughs> Cyrus will only hire you, Clint, if you shoot a mini DV. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Congrats, Congrats, Cyrus. All right. Well, listen, I mean, we have to wrap this up. It has been, like I said earlier, it has been a pleasure. Uh, I hope I see all of you in real life someday if COVID would end. Um, speaking as a registered nurse that I am in real life, I am so tired of COVID and I cannot wait for us to be able to walk outside without masks on and all the social distancing and we can just go back to having fun and doing these crazy projects that we get thrown into. Um, but I thank you all very much. And, you know, thank you for being a, in a movie about gay marriage in 2001, because it was a, I can tell you having watched the movie just as a spectator, because Norm did not ask me to be in the movie. Wow. Um, having just been a spectator, was it was one. a thrill watching it. And I was very happy to see all of you being a part of it. And it made it, it made a difference, at least to me, it made me feel better about it. So I'm one person, but it definitely had the effect that you would want something like that to have. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna say goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. It was fun Bye. talking to you. Thank you very Sorry much. I was late. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Thanks, you guys. Hi, Hi everyone. Christian. See the wedding video online. September 30th through October 4th. Thank you.